they also, you know, don't have predators, essentially. They, you know, they're vulnerable when they're first born or when they're young for a short amount of time, but they grow so fast that before you know it, they're too big for anything that we have here to eat them. The award-winning Tennessee Wildcast is on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, wildlife watching, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. We're glad you're tuning in. Thanks for watching and listening. We're back at Region 3. Yes. Since we're here, we're going to shoot multiple shows. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have a good time here. and. Uh, appreciate Mimi having us. Uh, we've got another fun show lined up for you today. It's maybe not a, the most fun topic, but it's what folks need to know about. Uh, invasive species, invasive carp specifically today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, good conversation. Uh, the great thing is we don't have them in Region 3 right now. No, we want to So that's make sure good. That. Yes. So that's why we're talking about this today to make sure you know how to keep them from moving or how you can help. Let us know what you see, et cetera, et cetera. But today we have Cole Hardy, the ANS coordinator with us, and Kristen Chestnut Fall, the regional invasive carp manager for the for Region Three. So appreciate you guys joining us. Thank Thanks you. For Thanks for having us. us. I'm excited to meet you guys. Uh, I know Cole. I don't know Kristen very well, so we're excited to learn a little about about you and and. Uh, what do you say we just jump right in with that yeah we don't have carp here yet but we still get a lot of questions so thanks for helping us um, spread good knowledge mm -hmm. yeah for sure uh cole why don't you jump in folks have met you you've been on uh, another show with us before you've been on a couple shows and uh, so go ahead and remind folks what you do for the agency and then we'll jump in with Kristen. all right well i'm the aquatic nuisance species coordinator so i really uh work with our fishery staff all across the state uh, dealing with nuisance species, invasive species. Um, you know, I spend, I spend a good amount of my time uh, focused on invasive carp, so <laughs> this is a, a, a pretty pertinent show here. <laughs> yeah. So. You're heading west usually, so yep. we appreciate you coming east. That's right, yep. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, uh, it's important. What you do is important. Uh, you know, all our positions <laughs> are, are needed, but this one... As, as those fish move in, those invasives move in, we have to... We're going to keep trying to knock them yeah. back. That's that's what we're working on. Yeah. And before we get to you, Kristen, you know, I didn't ask, um, what what was your graduate work focused on? Did you did you focus on aquatic nuisance species? I did not. I, uh, my <laughs> <laughs> <Of> no, <course. laughs> my, my graduate work focused on uh, catfish. And wow. it, was, it was exciting work at Tennessee Tech. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, worked with channel catfish and blue catfish on... Uh, a couple of Tennessee River reservoirs, uh, Kentucky Lake, Chickamauga, and Fort Loudon. So, okay, okay. Um, cool. But, you know, uh, I also was a technician while I was at Tennessee Tech working for the, the fisheries unit there. So um, there was another student at the time doing invasive carp work and really some of the, the initial work in the state here that happened. Um, and I got to, got to be a, a part of that, you know, going out and assisting mm -hmm. with that project. So... Um, kind of familiar with it from from the, the get-go back in at least 2015-ish. Mm -hmm. we got to look so. at all the species. Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Uh, so, so, Kristen, is this your first Wildcast? This is my it first is. Wildcast, oh, yes. How exciting. <laughs> and nervous. <laughs> it's fun. No. Um, so, so, tell us about yourself and your background. So, I've been with the agency for about a year and a half now. Um, I've been in Tennessee for about almost three years now, so I did a little bit of like private consulting work before getting hired on. Um, and so I'm the inv invasive uh, carp manager here in Region 3, so I spend a lot of time up and down the Tennessee River on the um, eastern side looking for carp. What's your background? Um, my background is more in sport fish management. I did my master's work on catfish as well <laughs> <laughs> um, in West Virginia, hmm. uh, doing some population dynamic stuff. And I also helped on some carp stuff while in grad school um, up and down the Ohio River um, monitoring the uh, receivers okay. to, to track them. So. And you both probably are well aware of how invasive carp impact everything. So, so yeah. Yes. They do. <laughs> so where did you go to school? I guess not in Tennessee, right? No, I uh, 
I did most <laughs> half of my master's at West Virginia University uh, okay. and then the other half in Missouri at Missouri State University. Okay. okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, always knowledge. curious where folks studied and when they come from. You know, a lot of a lot of folks come from from tech or ut yeah. so I'm, I'm always interested yes i'm new to tennessee <laughs> yeah we're glad you're here for sure uh, one other quick question maybe this is for cole so are, do we have other folks like Kristen around the state we do uh so Kristen is like you've mentioned our region three invasive carp crew lead right. uh we're hoping to hire a, a technician uh for her here soon um and that will essentially complete our Region 3 crew. We also have a uh, full crew over in Region 1, mm -hmm. so Western Tennessee. Um, and that uh, consists of a manager 1, a tech 2, and a tech 1 over there. And their their full-time duties are um, carp work. Okay. So, yep. so they, 1 and 3 right they're, now. They're keeping pretty busy over there on uh, Real Foot and Kentucky Lake mm. and Barkley. And they also, both Kristen and the Region 1 crew, um, really do work kind of across the state you mm -hmm. know so uh, we do have some s systems in region two um, you know Cheatham Reservoir and uh, into Old Hickory there that uh, also have carp and some work on the Duck River too so um, the carp invasive carp crews really work kind of throughout the whole Mm. Carp region, I guess. Yeah, they they help each other out and <laughs> move around. Let's let's not let that stick. Yeah. Let's not call it the carp region. <laughs> <laughs> so we we've talked about invasive carp many times, mm -hmm. but um, let's say someone is new to to that term, invasive carp. Mm -hmm. Let's just back up and kind of define that. What okay. what are we talking about? So there are four species of invasive carp. They're kind of all categorized within that that term um you know two of the or i guess the, probably the lesser known is the black carp uh, it's a molluscivore and it's would be particularly negative here in tennessee if those populations start to grow um we've only had a couple of them show up in kentucky lake uh, not here in recent years uh, i think it's been back in 2018 when mm. uh, uh, just a handful of fish were found and we're we're always watching for more um but you know being a, a molluscivore like they are uh they can they, they feed on mussels and snails and tennessee has a really high diversity of uh, yeah. of mussels and a lot of those are endangered so mm -hmm. um you know that's a, a pretty significant threat to our our native mm -hmm. mussel populations um Another one that uh, people have probably heard of, grass carp. They're pretty well known. They've been used, you know, really throughout the country for uh, vegetation control, uh, largely in ponds and yeah. places like that. They've been stocked, you know. So People say, I need to clean out a pond. They go get grass <laughs> yep, carp. They yeah. do. And, and you know, uh, in the early days, it wasn't always this way. And we're, we've got some feral populations that can reproduce within the Mississippi River Basin. But... Nowadays, the the push is really triploid grass carp, which means they've been modified in a way to where they're sterile and they can't reproduce. Hmm. Um, so those are required in, in Tennessee. If you're going to stock grass carp, they need to be triploid and throughout really the majority of other states. Um, then the other two, uh, they're, they're pretty similar in kind of their tendencies, both how they, how they feed and things like that, um, are big head carp and silver carp. Um, they are filter feeders, eat real low on the food chain, eat zooplankton, phytoplankton, you know, uh, really the base of the food chain that any of our larval sport fish, you know, our young sport fish rely on. Mm. Um, they eat, you know, the same things that fish like paddlefish, uh, other native filter feeders rely on as well. Um, you know, we're definitely worried about how abundant the silver carp can become sure um, they're the ones that you know we've probably all seen it at this point uh, being shown jumping out of the water um, sometimes called jumping carp or you yep. know they got a lot of names yep and and they can be dangerous yeah. it's you know you don't want to be pulled by a tube or on skis mm, or something yeah. down the reservoir or fishing and have one of these things jump and hit you or jump in your boat and break your fishing poles or whatever so um, yeah. so, so that feeding pattern I, I was just going to ask you um why is this fish why are these invasive fish so successful how are they so successful in our state so a couple of things you know we, we do have 
uh, very productive systems. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of resources out there for them, um, which is really a good thing because our our native fish seem to still be able to sustain and, well. and get what they need and do well. Um, we haven't seen the populations explode to such a level yet in our systems uh, like they have maybe in some other areas. Hmm. Um, certainly are concerned about that and watching for more of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but they they also you know don't have predators essentially they you know they're vulnerable when they're first born or when they're young for a short amount of time but they grow so fast that before you know it they're too big for anything that we have here to eat them so they're growing faster than our native species right yep and so they they're able to kind of exploit that that new niche if you will that's uh that nothing can nothing can prey on them and nothing can um, and you know they've got the resources they need. So yeah. yeah. Well, so where do I think specifically about the 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 uh, silver carp? Where do they come from? How'd they get here? So um, they're native to parts of Asia, um, and they were brought over to the states uh, for a variety of reasons. You know, from uh, aquaculture, uh, you know, using them in pond settings to um, you know, keep the keep the algae removed, sure. uh, keep the vegetation down, mm. keep the snails and the mussels um, off of the, out of the ponds. And Obviously, redu- before we had any knowledge, right? Well, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so, um, you know, they're also brought over and and used in some situations for food fish. There yeah. there is a, a demand for them, a market for them in certain areas, and uh, um, you know, so once they were brought over. Uh, they were eventually released or escaped in one way or another, um, ended up in the Mississippi River and have since kind of spread throughout the Mississippi and its tributaries and are, are impacting, you know, states throughout the central portion of the, the country, really. So that is their spread right now across the United States, it, mostly along that Mississippi essentially, River system. Yeah, essentially the whole Mississippi River Basin uh, is being impacted by them and, and with some, you know, additional uh, threats right now to other basins. So um, something that uh, is a, we've got an eye on right now is the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway. So for folks that aren't familiar over at Pickwick, mm-hmm. uh, there's a connection uh, from the Tennessee River Basin to the Mobile River Basin, and that would be, um, you know, a, a potential linkage where these fish could actually jump to a whole new, a whole new basin. Wow. Oh. Yeah. So, but right now we talk about where they are. Right now, it's just as far as for Tennessee, where are they? Where can people find them? Uh, so in Tennessee, uh, you know, our western border is the Mississippi River, and they're there uh, in large numbers. They reproduce on a fairly regular basis. Um, they then cut up into the Ohio River and move into the Tennessee and Cumberland through our uh, lock and dam systems. So we've got them on the Tennessee River in Kentucky Lake and Pickwick um, in Tennessee, and then the, on the Cumberland River, then Barkley, uh, Cheatham, and Old Hickory Reservoirs. So those are, those are the... Um, primary locations of course anywhere they've got access to tributaries that enter those reservoir systems Mm -hmm. they can move up into those and there are some uh you know individual reports from further upstream um in the tennessee river uh places like gunnersville and a report from chickamauga from 2020 um and so you know those those are isolated at this point reports um not what we are seen as an established population. Right. So. And we'll talk about reporting here in a little bit. Yes. But, um, so, so how they feed, how quickly they grow has an impact but um, on our native species. But tell us a little bit about what happens to an economy or how they're impacting anglers um, in these areas. Right. So, you know, they have the potential to negatively impact our native species. And if they do, you know, we would certainly expect... Um, a, a downturn from from actual negative impacts that they're having on our resources. The the um, kind of flip side of that is uh, even if they're not having this 
um, significant negative impact on our native species, people don't want to deal with them. Mm. Like, if you're going out fishing, mm -hmm. you don't want to go to a spot where you have to deal with wading through carp on your on your depth finder while you're looking for fish or have something that's going to jump in the boat mm -hmm. and and or hit you you know and, and potentially harm you and so uh, it, it's it's detrimental to some of these lo local places you know these places kentucky lake and barkley it's had a pretty significant impact there um you know potentially just perceived uh impacts that people see and moving them elsewhere so tournaments leave um, recreational angling Yikes. drops mm -hmm. um, yeah. because they hear and see carp. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, so yeah. how are they... And this is a little further down on our list of questions, but how are they spreading then? So in Tennessee, they, they move, and really in other places throughout the basin as well, um, they move through locks and dams. Uh, so really the navigation locks that we have established on the Cumberland River and the Tennessee River. Um, you know, they allow for barge traffic and recreational navigation. Um, the, the fish actually enter those locks as barges are, or boats are moving up and down mm -hmm. and can move from one system to the next. What about that whole bait, uh, moving bait? Bait can be a concern. Because um, they look really similar. They do. Uh, similar to they, normal bait fish that do. you would use and, to fish with. And, and we've got some regulations in place now kind of as a result of their similarities that, uh, you know, over in the western part of the state where we've seen um, small carp present, uh, that you're not supposed to move bait. Mm -hmm. uh, like shad and uh, skipjack and things like that that are that might be similar in appearance so um because you lay them next to each other you, you it's hard to tell yeah it's, it's, it's to, about to eye the untrained, placement and things yeah you know. to the untrained eye it can be very difficult to tell them apart and especially so, smaller ones. Yeah, yeah so in, in general you know we don't want people to dump bait ever um whether you buy it from the store or collect it yourself um it's it's best to if you're if you're not going to use it or if you're done for the day uh, to dump that bait in the trash uh, because it's hard for people to hear but it <laughs> it is, is. it it yep. impacts so many different things please don't dump yep. the bait <laughs> because just not being able to identify something accurately or, or taking the time to even know what's in that in that bait bucket if you just dump it out you might be introducing something yeah yeah, yeah. and we're talking about carp today but we've talked about ans in the past mm -hmm. and it could be a crayfish that's invasive it could yep. be a salamander that has a negative impact something you don't even see you know yes yep. mm -hmm. microscopic like <laughs> you mm -hmm. talked about before in other shows you know mm -hmm. the the zebra mussels and things like that yeah it's yeah yeah, yeah. So, so that invasive carp, it's a huge one. I mean, we have so many invasive species moving in or in Tennessee already, but invasive carp, we see that economic impact. We see the impact on anglers and our native, uh, our native fish species. Right. Woo, you got a big job. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot going on. We're, we're, we're trying hard here. I'm tired just talking. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to learn about what Kristen does in, in the region and what the regional focus is, you know, what... What you, you are doing, I guess you're a one-man crew right now, right? Uh, yes, but I have a lot of other managers and techs helping me out a lot of and help. an intern. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, we have help. So um, what we really do in Region 3 is we go below the major dams on the Tennessee River. So like um, Nickajack Dam, Chickamauga Dam, Watts Bar Dam, mm. Fort Loudoun Dam, and Melton Hill. And we do monitoring surveys. Um, so we go out every other week pretty much from at least May to September, and um, monitor what's below these dams to see if any fish are trying to move up or, or if we can pick any up. And we've been doing this since 2020, and we've never collected a carp. So that's awesome. That's, uh, that's great news, yeah. Yes, and we've spent a lot of hours out, you know, looking. I think in 2020 it was over 25 hours just electrofishing, mm -hmm. and then we over that, doubled that in 2021. And that's, that's just electrofishing pedal time. <laughs> Specifically for so, yeah. these fish. So yeah. okay. we, yeah. we also do, you know, annual sport fish surveys, so we're out there in different places, and if we would see anything, you know, we would note that, write that down, hmm. let Cole know. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have a uh, krill technicians out there um last year it was on chickamauga this year it's on nickajack so he's out there every almost every day talking to anglers seeing what they're seeing you know 
So we have so, a lot of different, you know, ways to monitor. Yeah. So at this point, we're safe here in, in our region. Watts Bar, Chickamauga, all those names. Um, you know how hot Chickamauga is yeah. right now on the fishing circuit. We're safe right now. For right now, we can at least say that <laughs> that that we are not encountering these species in our surveys. We, you know, we we don't have an established population here. Um, and, and you know, just to add on to what Kristen said too, the the number of people out on these resources on a daily basis. You know, if there were people encountering these fish, uh, we'd be. We'd be getting reports of that. You'd be hearing about it, yeah. 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 So, um, you know, just the fact that, Kristen, we have you in place. Uh, so much care goes in and so much science goes into our reservoirs and our fisheries and wildlife, everything that we're doing across the state, that science is important. But you're in place. Um, we don't yes. have them yet. But we're we're looking we're, yeah. heavily. Yes, and we're ready to go if if we would ever you know pick something up. As an angler, I, I really appreciate. I mean, personally, exactly. uh, I hope our anglers recognize that effort and and thank you for what you both um, do. I mean, we're I hope we're ahead of it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's great to hear as an angler that there's that we're out there trying to get mm -hmm. out in front of it and and you know mm -hmm. make those steps. Yeah. That's definitely so. I've heard dams and locks mentioned, and one of the questions that we repeatedly get through social media and other outlets is um, what can be done in those areas, or why aren't y'all doing things in these areas? So, so talk mm -hmm. to us about that, those efforts and, okay. and what can be done. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the issue with these fish moving through the locks has um, been identified. You know, we know that's how they're getting here, and so uh, a key focus of some of the research that's happening um, I, I'll go into a, a couple examples about what's going on, but is is trying to prevent these things from moving through there. Mm -hmm. That's how we're we're going to stop them. Um, thankfully, we don't see them reproducing on a regular basis in our system, so it gives us some hope that we we still have a chance that uh, with what we've got in place, we can knock them back. But I didn't know that. Uh, That's great. <laughs> um, but. But as far as these uh, locks and, and these deterrent systems or barriers you've probably heard referred to, yeah, um, there are a few different types of options that are all being explored right now. There's one called the BAF, a bioacoustic fish fence in, in place on an experimental basis on at Barkley Lock. Mm -hmm. uh, and it incorporates sound and lights and bubbles at the entrance of the lock, which uh, is basically a, a way of trying to deter these fish, trying to steer them aside and keep them out of the lock. Um, and, you know, that that works, uh, at least from, from the preliminary research here we're seeing, mm -hmm. and, and part of the, the reasoning behind that is these fish are more sensitive to stimulus than a lot of our native fish. Is that why they jump? I mean, is that why you that's, see them jumping that's out That's one lot? of the hypotheses behind, well, yeah, why silver carp will jump. You yeah. know, they get startled by a boat engine or uh, on a quiet morning if you're in a canoe and you <laughs> slap the paddle on the water, you know, they might jump out of the water. But So that uh, fence, I mean, that's... But yeah, so, so not, this, yeah. this uh, it's a bubble curtain yeah. um, and, you mm -hmm. know, it's just a, a lot of activity, a lot of commotion, something that they want to tend to avoid and, mm -hmm. and swim away from. So... Um, it's showing promise. Um, I don't have any of the n numbers here on me right now. It's, um, I think, over 50% of deterrence with some of the fish that they've had tagged. Um, other preliminary estimates were even as high as um, 95%. But um, it's, it's still very early in that experiment, and we've got a lot more to come on that. So yeah. um, fingers crossed that that, that will have uh, <laughs> some significant impacts because... <laughs> Uh, none of these technologies that are being explored right now, you know, they're looking at uh, CO2 and uh, within the locks and um, electricity and things like that. Uh, we don't expect any of them to be 100% effective. Hmm. Um, it's just kind of the reality of the situation and the, the current technology available. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we are, we are pushing for implementing these barriers on our systems um, they're expensive uh, they take uh, you know a lot of partners to be involved the, the TVA and the Army Corps um, you know all have interests in in these dams mm -hmm. um, yep 
And so, yeah, we don't control or own the dance. Right. Yeah. We, 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 we don't at all, <laughs> but you know, we're, we're working with these partners and, and really trying to, trying to establish something, trying to get something implemented. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. The, uh, we work great with a lot you know, all those folks. It's, yep. mm-hmm. There's some good relationships there. And we've had some, some good movement here too. You know, we've, uh, the TVA completed a, an environmental assessment here not too long ago. That's a big step in the right direction for potentially putting a, a deterrent system on the Tennessee River or multiple deterrent mm-hmm. systems on the Tennessee River. Um, soon here, the Army Corps is going to be uh, completing a, a environmental assessment of their own. Mm-hmm. So, um, and w- yeah. one other thing, Cole, that you mentioned to us previously is that you're, it's not just Tennessee that's, that has this issue. You're right. working, you share that data, you share information interstate. Um, yes. So we're not in it alone, mm-hmm. and I think that's important to mention. Yeah, not not at all. We're working with states throughout the Mississippi River Basin. Um, you know, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, you know, has has awarded grants really to uh, states throughout the basin to work on carp, um, and we're sharing things with them regularly. Um, you know, it, it's it's important to. Uh, to be able to know what other states are doing, to to share what we're doing in our state with them, yeah. and so that you know, even though what they learn in, say, Illinois or Louisiana may not um, be directly comparable to what we have going on here in Tennessee, it's entirely possible that they might learn something that we could we could adapt to our system and use. So. Sure. Um, we also rely on, um, I think you mentioned it, Kristen, um, um, creel surveys and what our anglers are actually seeing out there. So talk to us a little bit in our few minutes here, because mm-hmm. I know we're You're about to <laughs> tell people how they can report. If they think they have seen um, an invasive carp, what do they do? So best thing you can do is uh, get up with your regional office. Um, you know, if there's, if you're seeing juvenile carp in west tennessee we want to know about that we don't need to know about adults over there we kind of know they're there um but anywhere in east tennessee uh, we certainly want to know uh if you see a carp uh, get the best picture you can freeze that fish um and then get up with your re- regional office yeah and regional contacts tmwildlife.org you can find phone numbers addresses all that on our website so we want to know about it. Yes. We have a lot of information on invasive carp at tnwildlife.org, too. We encourage people to visit the website, learn about this fish, learn to identify it, yeah. and definitely reach out to us with questions. And a lot more on some of the programs that I, w- I was too long-winded to get to, today. <laughs> <laughs> like our like our harvest programs and stuff. Oh, yeah. 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 A lot harvest of program. Commercial anglers bringing in a lot of, yep. a lot of pounds o- of fish. Over 16 million pounds since the start of it. Yes, that, so. that's awesome. Yep. Thank you both. <laughs> So, great thank information. You. Yeah, Thanks great for stuff. Us. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Thank you, uh, Cole. It's uh, a lot of good information, a lot of things we couldn't cover today, but a lot of good work going on out there to stop the movement. Uh, some people think we're sitting around, but no, we're out there working. <laughs> <laughs> we're busy. We're busy, folks. So I appreciate what you guys do. Uh, it's nice to meet you today. Yes, yeah, nice to meet you, Jason. And uh, this is Tennessee Wildcats. Thank you, Mimi. My pleasure. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, it's all about Tennessee wildlife. It's what we do. Tennessee Wildcast will be on the air again next week. We'll see you then.